Good morning. I'm Dega McDowell in from Maria Bartiromo. It's Monday, June 4th. Your top story is at 7 a.m. Eastern. Starting the week on an upbeat note, 126-point gain on the Dow futures right now. We've got a rally on our hands. The Dow right now, percentage-wise, is the biggest mover to the upside. This is after stocks rallied on Friday following that better-than-expected jobs report. The global markets starting Monday with gains as well. In Europe, we have green across the board in England, France, and Germany. And in Asia overnight, it was the exact same story. All four major markets there to the upside. But here at home, trade turmoil. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross returns from China with no deal. It comes as our allies ramp up their threats of retaliation over steel and aluminum tariffs that the U.S. has slapped on them. But White House Trade Policy Director Peter Navarro standing firm on the need for these tariffs. At the end of the day, this is a trade dispute and the president is going to defend this country. He stands for American workers and he's standing up for them now. The reaction from Capitol Hill straight ahead. Facebook under fire. A new report from the New York Times says that the social media giant gave users data to device makers, including Apple and Samsung. This raising new privacy concerns this morning. Plus the power to pardon. President Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, is sparking a major debate over whether President Trump can pardon himself. Jeep. Getting into the subscription game, the automaker set to launch its service next year. How it will work coming up. And LeBron James re-wears his suit with shorts. That's not the only, line, uh, only news out of the game. And he wasn't the only person wearing those duds. I'm kind of digging it, all that and so much more this morning. Fox News contributor Kat Temp is here, benchmark managing partner Kevin Kelly and Mass Lansky and partners President Lee Carter. Although Kevin's behind a, the desk, I can report he's wearing full-length trousers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought that trend went out over a year ago. I was actually talking to some of my buddies over the weekend about the, the short suit situation, and it was a quick fad for like a hot second. And... I think it's passed. Well, now, yeah, don't... now it's going to become a fad again. No, if you got good, if you got good gams, show them all. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I said that on Friday, but I think this summer is the no sock summer. I think you're actually supposed to wear full length pants with no socks. I had yeah. no idea. That's that's the. There Lee, you just, are. Lee just up. made a face. Again, we need more emojis. We need an emoji <laughs> to reflect the face that Lee just made at Kevin I'm Kelly. Just keeping you up on the trend. I like the bright colored socks. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Come, oh, Mike Pompeo's socks. How about those with the little the soldiers? There you go. Send a message to North Korea. Coming up this morning, Office of Management and Budget Director Mick Mulvaney is here. Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano and the host of Varney and Company, Stuart Varney. You don't want to miss any of those gentlemen. But first, our top story this hour, standing tall on trade. The Trump administration showing no signs of backing down from imposing tariffs on our allies despite a pushback from those very allies and China. The idea that we are somehow a national security threat to the United States is quite frankly insulting and unacceptable. I regard this as more of a family quarrel. This is, um, this is a, uh, a trade dispute, if you will. It can be solved. And Mr. Trudeau, I, I, I think he's overreacting. But the point is, we have to protect ourselves. All we're doing here, all the president is doing, is defending this country's national security, sovereignty, and economic security from the flood of imports. Joining us now, House Energy and Commerce Committee member, Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee, who's currently running for the Senate. Congresswoman, always a pleasure to see it's you. It's good to see you. Aren't Republicans, though, if you're running for re-election in the House, if you're running for office in November, aren't they worried about the impact on their constituents, on the voters, about these tariffs and the retaliation that could happen? We are watching it very closely. Of course, uh, we know that the intention is to punish bad actors and not the American consumer. So that is something everybody agrees on. We are concerned when it comes to auto manufacturers, auto parts manufacturers, boat 
manufacturers that we have in Tennessee that use a tremendous amount of sheet aluminum. We are watching it closely. You've got washing machine manufacturers that are there. And, and we've already concerns. imposed tariffs on a washing Right, machine. and we're talking to them every day. And we're waiting to see exactly what's going to happen, what exemptions are going to take place, and how this is going to come down. Donald Trump goes through a process in negotiating. So we're, we're in the conversation, talking to commerce and trade, and uh, you know, still trying to work still, through this. Still, the bottom line is tariffs always wind up as a tax on the consumer, and there's really no way around that. And uh, I know the president's goal is to bring jobs back on shore. And that's why it's so important to stay engaged in this process with commerce and the trade rep and talking with your constituent companies who use steel and aluminum. A lot of tool and die processing in Tennessee because of the auto manufacturers that are there. And what you do not want to do is to take a step that is going to end up having them charge more and of course taxes and tariffs are something that give us concern but also disadvantaged trade is something that has given us some concern. But you talk about the, the talking about bad actors but Canada is a valuable ally. Absolutely Mexico, they are. And particularly Europe and Absolutely. so that's the one thing that a lot of people can't get their head around is if the real bad actor, in terms of stealing our intellectual property, in terms of demanding that U.S. companies hand over uh, their technology in order right. to do business in China, that if the real bad actor in the room and on the world stage is China, so we ought to be, as I've said, locking arms with those allies, rather than essentially trying to protect 140,000 steel jobs in the United States, protect a union, while Here's, then basically putting all these other jobs in the state of the consumer right. in jeopardy. And here, here's an example of that. I was talking with someone that works in this space, in the manufacturing space, and there is a particular sheet aluminum that they use that is not manufactured in the U.S. So you're disadvantaging them if they have to pay that tariff in order to get that product that is an essential product in the product they manufacture, then you're running their price up. China is the bad actor. They have been stealing our intellectual property for decades. It has, they have stole, they've infringed, and yes, they need to be dealt with. And I know the secretary, Secretary Ross is working through that process, trying to get some concessions with him. This is something that that Lee raised because again, it's not just the tariffs on steel and aluminum; it's the right. retaliatory tariffs on Correct. that are. I think the ones from Canada go into effect July the first, and they're targeting red states and Republican districts, whether it's on motorboats, sailboats, uh, cranberries. Uh, targeting pork, soy, right? You know, soy which are Tennessee products. We sent Connell's yeah. in a, a, a on a soybean farm out in Iowa. Connell McShane, we're going to get to him. So it, it's very, it's obvious what the the retaliation right. is is meant to go after. But to that point, have you, business owners in your district, have they been calling your office saying, what the heck is going on? What they are doing is calling and we're talking with them about what the sp a specific impact would be on them and that's what you want to know so that when you're talking with the administration you can say how about this how what is that impact going to be now i Are met they giving in you tennessee answers? yes and i've uh, sat down and met with farmers in tennessee i have met with uh individuals that sell to small business manufacturers and those small business manufacturers themselves and they are they're concerned about it because the tax cuts are working, they are ramping up, their orders have increased, some of them are adding production, and they want to keep the focus on growth and productivity. And their concern is, let's not do anything that is going to cause us to hit the brakes. Let's look at what is going to continue mm -hmm. with a ready supply chain of the products that we need to manufacture the products we can sell 
and generate more jobs and more economic activity. So, uh, of course, we're going to watch this very closely and continue the conversations with constituents and other policy But I listened to the people from the administration on uh, on Sunday yesterday. Peter Navarro was on with Maria. Larry Kudlow was on Fox News Sunday. Can they, uh, can they assure you and your constituents and the American people who are going to be hurt by this, American businesses, that there isn't going to be any pain? Or are they saying this is pain that you need to deal with? What is What are they telling you? Well, we will see exactly how they're going to approach that this week. We're going back to D.C. Okay. tomorrow, and we will see what their conversations are going to entail. What we're trying to do is to arrive at a spot where we can say, you know, this is going to have an impact, this is not going to have right. an impact. Do not adversely impact the American consumer or the American manufacturer, the job creator. I want to move on to North Korea, Congress, sure. Congressman. The country shaking up its top military brass ahead of the summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un set for June 12th. North Korea's top three military officials have been reportedly removed from their post. And now there are reports that Russian President Vladimir Putin has invited Kim Jong-un to Russia. Your take on this ahead of this high-stakes summit? Because, again, the president has the G7 this in Quebec this Friday and Saturday. Then he's got to go to Singapore for that. And then he's got to deal with, later on, pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal. So... I tell you what, they're giving America something to talk about, aren't they? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, I think that everybody's now wanting a summit. Uh, Putin wants a summit with Trump. And, uh, you know, right. so we're into the sit and talk. The good thing is uh, North Korea is at the table. This is a situation that has festered because it's languished for decades. And I applaud the president and his team and Secretary Pompeo, who is really doing a tremendous job, uh, for getting him to the table and for having these discussions and trying to bring an end to this conflict. So that, I think, is to be applauded. Uh, real quick, Facebook on the defensive yes. this morning is a story yes. in the New York Times. Yes, they ought to be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Right. This, but this is an, an incredible piece of investigative journalism. Right. It, the report details the scope of its data sharing deals with 60 device makers, including Apple, Samsung, Microsoft. According to the Times, the partnerships gave the companies um, access to users' personal data as well as the information of their friends, even if they specifically blocked Facebook from sharing their information from third parties. This is like the Cambridge Analytica scandal, but that was app developers. Facebook said, oh, we ended that in 2014, but not this. They only started dialing this back in April when it looked like they were going to get caught, probably. That's exactly right. And this is why we have been on all of these edge providers, Facebook, YouTube, Google, the search engines, all of them, because we need to have privacy legislation. It's like the Wild West. Your bank, your health care, everybody has privacy standards. This segment of the virtual space, zero privacy standards. That's why we need to pass the Browser Act. That's why we need a data security bill. You, the consumer, need the ability to opt in and decide what of your identifying information. Hey, Congresswoman, you were you co-chaired the bipartisan privacy working group yes. on this. And one of the biggest issues that I'm seeing happening yes. through Facebook and situations like this is that you're able to target ads and discriminate. I mean, basically what happened with Facebook is in the fall, ProPublica exposed how you could do housing ads to target whites only. And so it went against African-Americans, mother of high school kids. When are they going to be held accountable? We continue to try to hold them accountable, and CPNI is this bundle of information. It is yours. You should be able to protect, as I say, the virtual you. And the fact that Facebook or Google or any of these edge providers are without your consent, wow. they share you. Right. Your virtual you online, they're doing it without your consent, needs to stop. That's why we need to pass the legislation. Congressman Marsha Blackburn, 
great Good to see, see you. A, ni a nice uh, southern voice in the rain. Yeah. So, <laughs> praising that. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you. Take care. Coming up, power of the pardon. Rudy Giuliani says the president probably could pardon himself if needed in the Russia probe. The new debate ahead. And LeBron James stirring things up off the court again with this pregame short suit. Now Draymond Green joining the trend. New studies suggest less, maybe more, when it comes to treating cancer. This is an incredible development. Cheryl Cassoni has the details. And one of the biggest studies that we've seen in particular with breast cancer, let's talk about this. Well, it's a federally funded study that is now suggesting that many women with early stage breast cancer could safely skip commonly used chemotherapy after surgery and that could spare patients from, of course, the difficult side effects while they're undergoing their treatment and also the cost of all of that to patients. And then there was a separate study that showed that many patients with advanced kidney cancer could avoid kidney removal surgery and instead take a new drug. Uh, these studies were both presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology's annual meeting. A lot of big news coming out of that meeting. Well, ticket buying website TicketFly is still offline after a massive data breach. A hacker stole the data of more than 26 million customers in the attack that apparently occurred on Wednesday. TicketFly has not paid the hackers ransom and confirmed some customer data was exposed, but credit card numbers and passwords luckily were not. Well, an anonymous fan has forked over a lot of cash to have lunch with Warren Buffett. The winning bid at an annual charity auction hit $3.3 million. That's, of course, to share a meal with Buffett. Believe it or not, though, this is not the record. One person paid nearly $3.5 million uh, one of the years that they've done this auction. It benefits the Glide Church in San Francisco. You may have heard of them. They're in an organization that offers free meals, health care, and other services to homeless and low-income people in the San Francisco. Bay Area Dagan. So uh, obviously we talk a lot about the lunch, but the truth is Glide does a lot of amazing work in San Francisco and they're going to be the benefits of this lunch. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. Coming up, Jeep hoping to rev things up with a subscription service. Find out how you can cruise into a new vehicle ahead and cozy up to the delightful sense of A1 steak sauce. I cannot wait to find out what Cat Temp thinks about the new candle that fills up your home of what they called well, of this meaty condiment. That's ahead. Presidential power as the Mueller investigation continues. Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani weighing in on just how much power the commander in chief has when it comes to ending the probe. Does this mean he can terminate any federal investigation? Is that is that the argument here? Any federal investigation he wow. can terminate? Yeah, yeah. I mean that, that that is pretty clear. If you're asking in a theoretical sense, yeah. I mean it would it could it could lead to impeachment. It could lead to I mean, if he terminated an investigation of himself, it could right. lead to. Also but constitutional. Mr. Giuliani also telling the Huffington Post that President Trump could have former FBI Director James Comey shot in the Oval Office and still not be indicted, saying impeachment would have to be the first step. Here now, Fox News Senior Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Much to talk about from yes. what Rudy said. Your reaction? Well, we'll start with the last one. The comment about having James Comey shot is incendiary, outrageous, and just plain wrong under the law. I mean, the president is immune from the rigors of prosecution during the time he's in office so as not to take him away from his presidential duties. But he is not immune from being charged. He is not immune from being indicted. And in the case of a crime of violence, he's not immune from being arrested. Th this, is, this is more extreme than when President Nixon once said, you remember this famous quote, Lee, if the president does it, that means it's not illegal. Forgive the double negative, I'm quoting him exactly. Uh, that would make the president a prince. That would remove the president from the confines of the rule of law. That would violate the president's oath to uphold the Constitution. When we were talking during the break, Rudy is throwing gasoline on fire. And it's either because his client 
the president likes chaos or because he and his legal team have decided the best way to undermine uh, Bob Mueller is to make incendiary and extreme statements about presidential power and shove them in Mueller's face. I don't think it's going to work. Can he pardon himself, you think? That, of course, has never happened before. The argument in favor of it is the pardoning power has been held by the court to be plenary, absolute and without check. The argument against it is the rule of law says you can't be a judge in your own case. You can't evaluate your own behavior. And the rule of law is embedded in the Constitution. So I don't know uh, which way that would go. In my view, it's a dangerous thing. I realize Chuck Todd Chuck Todd, because Rudy confused the name, put the question to him, so it's not Rudy's fault that he got the question. Right. But in my view, it's a dangerous thing for him to be discussing the very concept that the president, in order to avoid complying with the law, would pardon himself, I think would rub most Americans, even people that like him, as I do, the wrong way. Well, let's turn to the controversy surrounding what President Trump and people within the White House, uh, Trump supporters call Spygate. House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunes taking on his colleague, Congressman Trey Gowdy, on Sunday morning futures with Maria yesterday. Watch this. Mr. Gowdy believes that he's been told by the Department of Justice on several occasions that Mr. Trump's not a target. But what I keep going back to is, is that, well, wait a second, we know from Mr. Comey, he said that the Trump campaign was the reason that they opened up the counterintelligence investigation. So they did open up an investigation in the Trump campaign. It's two issues here. One is hair splitting over the meaning of the word target and the meaning of the word that Congressman Nunes did not use in that clip but did use elsewhere yesterday, subject. A subject is a person or entity or group that is being investigated by the government to see if the subject committed a crime. A target is a person, entity or group the government has already decided to indict. You can become, you can go from a subject to a target like that, depending upon what the evidence is that is found about you. Second, and this is dangerous, and, and we've been talking about this for a long time, Congressman Gowdy and Congressman Nunes saw the same raw intelligence FBI documents that you and I can't see. Gowdy looks at it and says, I'm a lawyer, I'm an ex-prosecutor, the FBI behaved appropriately, there was no spy, there was no uh, undercover FBI person in the Trump campaign as Rudy Giuliani claimed. Congressman Nunes looks at the same document and said, I wouldn't put it quite that way. This is the danger of exposing raw intelligence documents to politicians who then draw their own political narrative from it. So Go Do ahead. you think that anything will actually happen with this? I know that President Trump talks about it a lot, but is there any actual legal problem here? Well, if there truly was an undercover FBI agent pretending to be a Republican operative, wouldn't you have known if he was a Republican operative or not, who made his way into the campaign? They would need to have gotten a search warrant to do that because that's the functional equivalent of a full-time surveillance. Every time he's there, he's seeing and, and listening uh, to what's going on. Uh, and if they got the search warrant, I would like to see what they told a federal judgment, a federal judge, in order to get the judge to sign the warrant. If they did this without a search warrant, they committed serious and grave violations. But Kat, there is no evidence. I'm relying on Congressman Gowdy, who saw the documents and told me the non-classified parts of what he saw. There is zero evidence that this happened. What? Can, could the president just release all these documents? Let the American people see them. No, the president doesn't have these documents. These documents are in the possession of Bob Mueller and his bosses at the Department of Justice. It is highly unusual and almost unheard of for documents in a criminal investigation to be released to the potential defendant, no matter who he is, before the charges have even been but filed. We should point out the inspector general is looking into this, isn't he? Is he the not? inspector general is looking into whether or not the FBI violated DOJ regulations in the manner in which it commenced the Trump in, uh, campaign investigation and conducted the Hillary Clinton email investigation. And that report, my dear, is Ms. It, McDowell, is coming out this week or next, next week? Next week. They moved, before, they moved the testimony before of, the 4th of July. They moved the testimony of the Inspector General to next week. I think it's now scheduled for, I'm pulling this one out of my. It's June, 11, June, June 11th, I think, is when the Inspector General is supposed to testify. Good to see you. Pleasure. Love pleasure, you much. Pleasure, guys. Judge Andrew DePaul. Happy Monday morning.
Right on. Coming up, President Trump marking 500 days in office with an economic tailwind. We're live with Office of Management and Budget Director Mick Mulvaney. Plus, HelloFresh is saying hello to your neighborhood supermarket. We'll tell you where you can now pick up the dinner helper. Welcome back. I'm Dega McDowell in from Maria Bartiromo. It's Monday, June 4th. Your top stories at 7.30 a.m. Eastern. Starting the week on an up note, up big time. 135 point gain on the Dow futures right now. Gains across the board to start this Monday on the Dow, S&P and the NASDAQ. This after a major stock rally on Friday following that much better than expected jobs report. And global markets following suit starting this new week in Europe. We have buying in England and France. The DAX in Germany is dipped into negative territory ever so slightly. And in Asia overnight, it was green galore. We have gains on all three major markets, more four major markets there. President Trump marking a major milestone, 500 days in office. His agenda has followed the message that he sent on inauguration day. We must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Protection will lead to great prosperity and strength. We take a look back and ahead at the president's policy priorities and what it means for your checkbook, your family, your livelihood. And the happiest place on earth looking to bring smiles to its workers, Disney may raise its minimum wage to $15 an hour. Details on the fight for 15 ahead. Jeep getting into the subscription game. The automaker set to launch its service next year. How it will work coming up. And the Warriors take game two and Steph Curry breaks records. We have the highlights from last night's game. And then LeBron re-wears a suit with shorts there you go, but he wasn't alone. Again, the trend, it's catching on. And the scent of a steak dinner without lighting up the grill. A1, launching a line of candles. But first, a major milestone for President Trump, the commander in chief, marking his 500th day in office. And looking back, he's taken action on many of the key issues that he brought up on the campaign trail and during his inaugural address. January 20th, 2017, will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. Every decision on trade, on taxes, on immigration, on foreign affairs will be made to benefit American workers and American families. America will start winning again, winning like never before. On Friday, we saw the strength of the economy under President Trump. The May jobs report showed 223,000 jobs were added. That again was an acceleration from the job growth that we've seen in the last year. About 190,000 jobs was the monthly average before that came out. The unemployment rate fell to 3.8%. That's an 18-year low. Joining me now is Office of Management and Budget Director Mick Mulvaney. Good to see you, Mick. Your comments on where the economy is right now, and can we, I think the, the Atlanta Fed estimates that in the second quarter, we could be growing at close to 5%, 4.8%. Can we continue that quarter after quarter? It's truly an amazing testimony to what the American people and what the American economy can do if the government will just let them. Keep in mind the numbers that you're talking about, uh, not only the Atlanta Fed numbers, but the numbers that we're actually seeing are actually better than we anticipated when we first, when the president first took office, um, and much better than we were left under the previous administration. I remember the story after story when the president first took office that we could never get back to 3% growth. It wasn't possible. Um, Lawrence Summers was saying you couldn't do it. I think Ben Bernanke said you couldn't do it. Every, everybody who supposedly knew what was happening said that the country was simply not capable of growing at 3% again, and the president and his economic team 
absolutely believe that to be false, and it's exciting to be able to prove to people that the American economy is much stronger than people realize. And yes, uh, we do think it's sustainable because we think we've changed the fundamental structure. We haven't just lowered taxes, we've changed taxes. We haven't just uh, reduced regulation. We've gotten rid of the stuff that's on the books and slowed down the new stuff. So there's structural change that we do think is sustainable. The argument for making those corporate tax cuts permanent, and again, the Republicans catching heat from Democrats about that, but the argument is because you create certainty for businesses. They know next year and the year after that, and as far as the eye can see, that this is what their tax rate is going to be. They can plan, they can make long-term investment decisions and hiring decisions. But at the same time, now that you have these tariffs that were introduced, Mick, on steel and aluminum, we've gotten retaliatory measures announced by our allies, Canada, Mexico, and Europe, and we're in this trade, this trade negotiation, if you will, with Canada, that introduces uncertainty. And I want to know how that, that you kind of line those two things up, because, again, it seems like that the administration just snapped its fingers and said, hey, we're throwing these tariffs on steel and aluminum. And I've heard from manufacturers that use steel and aluminum and manufacturers that export to Canada, Mexico and Europe, that that is a very, very jarring, unnerving thing. And they're very worried about their businesses. Sure. Here's, here's what I say to folks. Um, Everything the president has done up to now has been with one goal in mind. You heard him give his speech there at the inauguration, which is that we are going to reclaim uh, the American economy for American families and American workers. And everything that he's done up to this point has been aimed at that one direction, whether it's taxes or regulation or energy policy. The trade policy is the same thing. Do you have to break some eggs to make an omelet? Absolutely. Do you have to be tough with people in order to get them to change their behavior? Absolutely. You cannot just ask other countries to treat us better and expect them to do it. That's not the way that the world works, but everything the president has done is designed to help American workers and the American family, and the trade policies is part and parcel of that. Will it be as quick to show results? Probably not, simply because we're dealing with foreign countries and not just Congress on the Hill. Um, but everything is aimed in the same direction. I hope folks give the president credit for that, uh, because I think he's proven and it has credibility when it comes to, to talking to people about helping American families. That's what our trade policies are doing. Look, Canada's an ally of ours. There's no question. But I don't think anybody watching this show could make an argument that the intellectual policy practices of the 1990s are the same that should be in place today. That's what we want to change. We want to update the agreement uh, with NAFTA. We want to improve our relations with our, our trade agreements with our folks but, overseas. That's what this is all about. But Nick, so the tariffs on steel and aluminum, it, they will hurt or send prices up. I think steel prices are up. They're up 40 percent just this year so far. The, that will hurt businesses that use steel and aluminum potentially here in the United States. And then you talk about all the other manufacturers that could face tariffs when they export goods to these other nations, these ally nations. So can you say to them, ultimately, this is a this is better for the United States, but your business and your family potentially will get hurt in the interim. Can you say that? Without reservation. And as evidence, they don't even have to believe me. They can look at everything else that this administration has done. So if you're watching this, this show this morning, you're wondering, was the president changed? No, the president hasn't changed. This is just part and parcel of what we're trying to accomplish. Everything else that he has done has been good for your business, good for the business owners, good for the folks who work there, and good for the families they take that money home to. And the trade policies are part and parcel of that. So I hope folks give the president some credit for the actions that he's already taken. You don't even have to believe what he says. Look at what he's done already and there's the proof that what he's doing is good for the American so they're economy. Gonna, but they're going to face short-term pain in the process is what you're saying. Again, but that's the way the world works when it comes to international affairs and trade policies specifically. Yes, there may be some short-term pain, but in the long term, American workers, American families are going to be better off. We absolutely believe that. That's what's driving everything that we do. And in fact, it's drive every, driven everything that we've done since we've been here. I noticed that the president was tweeting over the weekend that what with an $800 billion trade deficit, um, you can't, he, was, he, was, he was tweeting about it and, and, and talk about the use of the, the phrase trade war. But why not more tweeting about an actual debt that we owe, and that is our, our, our national debt, more than $21 trillion. And now, with this omnibus spending bill that was signed into law, we're now facing $1 trillion budget deficits every year. 
what are we going to do about that? Rather, what are you guys going to do about that to fix it? Other than growing the economy faster, which, again, at least in the short run, it seems to be working. Well, uh, keep in mind, there's only two things you can do to solve that problem. One would be to spend less, and the other would be to take in more. And you saw some of the president's hesitation about signing that omnibus because he is concerned yeah. about the amount of money that we're spending. But with Congress um, not being able to reduce its spending very dramatically, we do look forward to them taking up our rescissions bill, for example, here this week when they return. Uh, the focus has to be on the other side of that equation, which is how do you grow the economy. When people make more money, the government takes in more money in taxes. In fact, uh, it's the only way we actually take in more real money is for you and, and everybody else watching to make more money. So in a healthy American economy, when people are making more, the government takes in more revenue and that shrinks our deficits. We saw some really good first. I know the preliminary signs in the, uh, in the receipts that we took in mm -hmm. in April, the largest uh, receipts ever by the United States Treasury. I think it was more than half a trillion dollars in the this, in this, in this single month of April. So we're, we're, we're seeing some really, really good signs, some, some benefits starting to pay off from, the, from our policies. Uh, but we will continue to focus on growing the economy, not because it makes you more money, but because it makes the government more money as well. <laughs> they, I don't know if, you know, we, <laughs> the government making more money, you know, that sticks with people. I'm just kidding. Mick. Thank you so much. Mick Mulvaney, uh, budget director for President Donald Trump and the White House. Thank you so much. Coming up, the fight for 15 at the happiest place on earth. Workers at Disney getting closer to making $15 an hour. The latest on ongoing negotiations between officials and union members. Plus, Steph Curry setting a mind-boggling three-point shot record during the NBA Finals. But Draymond Green and LeBron James stealing the spotlight with those suits. Disney offering a $15 minimum wage to its theme park employees. Cheryl Cassani has the details, Cheryl. That's right. Disney plans to uh, raise its minimum wage from $10 to $15 an hour by the year 2021. Union representatives in Florida are going to head vote on the negotiating table this week to discuss the company's latest offer. Some union leaders say that Disney's plans include new rules that would affect how the employees are paid for working things like overtime, holidays, and that that would change how their schedules are made. So this story will continue later this week. Shares of Disney are down about 8% so far this year. Well, Jeep is driving into a new era of car ownership. They're launching a subscription program that's going to allow drivers to use vehicles for a monthly fee. This is part of its Jeep Wave loyalty program. And this comes, of course, as Jeep parent company Fiat Chrysler is looking to expand the Jeep brand, announcing on Friday it plans to launch several new vehicles, including a pickup truck by 2022. The subscription service is scheduled to be launched uh, sometime next year. Shares of Fiat Chrysler are lower in the pre-market, down about 2%. Well, more competition is ramping up in the ever-growing meal kit business. HelloFresh is going to start selling meal kits in two supermarket chains starting this Wednesday. And these kits are going to be sold in nearly 600 giant food and stop and shop stores. Uh, just last month, Blue Apron, you may remember, began selling their kits in Costco. Plated started selling their kits over at Albertsons. There's a theme, obviously, on that story. And then finally, let's stay with food. A1 Steak Sauce has got the perfect gift for any father out there. Meat-scented candles. Yes, three different fragrances for the discerning dad. Original meat, backyard barbecue, and classic burger for $15 for each candle. Dad can now get that smoky barbecue smell without actually having to fire up the grill. He can just sit on the couch, drink a beer, and light a candle. Shares of parent company Kraft Heinz are down 26% so far this year. Oh, but Dagan, have to get them while supplies last. You know, limited supply of those steak candles. I know you're interested in those. Gross. So, yeah. Yeah. I was so gonna, right, here's my question. Is Dad Temp <laughs> getting an A1 candle? No, Dad Father's Temp Day. will not be getting an A1 <laughs> candle for Father's Day. I think that's gross. Why would you want your whole house to smell like meats? Unless you're actually, I mean, yeah, I'm you're, with you. But you're from the Midwest. Yeah, I mean, it's not like I, the smell of meats is bad if there's meats around. Exactly. But I don't know. I think maybe my cat would like it, actually, if I made my house smell like meats. <laughs> but sorry, buddy, not going to happen. <laughs> You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like it when I barbecue and I have the smell stuck on me. I like I, I hate it on my clothes. So I'd rather just have firewood or something to but smell that. Maybe your spouse likes it, though. You need to check with her. 
I, I did. She does. Every, that's, how, that's how I know I smell like every, that. On every, she's like, what's the smell? It smells like charcoal. <laughs> did you burn something again, Kevin? Coming up, a GM executive driving the pace car at the Detroit Grand Prix. It looks easy, doesn't it? It's not. Oops, nobody was hurt. But again, they had to clean the debris off the track. That's a huge fail. We will show you this cringeworthy moment again and again coming up. Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors are two wins away from another NBA championship. Jared Max. What a show last night. Yeah, Dagan, it was a record-setting three-party hosted by Steph. He made the most three-pointers ever in an NBA Finals game. After being pushed to overtime in their Game 1 victory, the Warriors set the tone early in Game 2. The Dubs made the first seven shots, while Kevin Durant scored 26 and Klay Thompson had 20. Steph Curry was the star. Basketballs fell through the net like soft crumpets at Steph's three-party. It broke Ray Allen's finals record by one. He sank nine three-pointers, scored 33, five threes in the final quarter when the Warriors outscored the Cavs by nine. Golden State wins 122-103. Third year in a row, they lead the finals 2-0. Game three, Wednesday in Cleveland. LeBron James, not the only player who wore shorts to the finals last night. While LeBron added a hoodie to his Tom Brown suit, the Warriors' Draymond Green went Caribbean blue for his suit shorts that matched his snazzy blazer. Detroit Grand Prix was delayed yesterday because the pace car crashed. This blue Corvette ZR1, valued at $123,000, being driven by Mark Royce, an executive vice president at General Motors. In the passenger seat was IndyCar official Mark Sandy. Now, his airbag deployed. Both were taken to the infield and checked out and all good to go. Hey, look at Alex Rodriguez last night at the Sunday night baseball game. No, he's not making a comeback. Alex, who was broadcasting the Astros Red Sox game for ESPN last night, left the booth and played a little game of catch with Houston <laughs> Astros outfielder J.D. Davis, who throws it right back to him. Fun time back and forth into the crowd. And uh, just like they did in the World Series, Alex Rodriguez uh, had his girlfriend there with him to accompany at the uh, Minute Maid Park. Jennifer uh, Lopez also there at the game. Yeah, but was she up Aaron there? Was she sitting yeah, in the stands sitting with the, right, yeah, she with the little right, people? Yeah. She's the little people. She's underrated, I think. Underrated? She can sing, she can dance, she can act, she looks amazing. Yeah, but her choice of men is yeah, questionable. <laughs> Did he get booed? No, the, yeah, Alex is like, you know, for somebody who was so unpopular during his career, with the cheating and the lying about yeah. the cheating and getting caught about all that. Mm -hmm. he, his Q rating has been soaring since he he's, uh, he's last great in, in the broadcast booth, it's actually, terrific. in his commentary. But and he he actually doesn't text and drive when he's driving Indy cars because you can crash. No, Mark, <laughs> they were not well, it's, texting. Oh, I got an alert. oh, shoot. No, they were not texting. That's just, again, well, because driving on I'm a racetrack. joking around no, here. I know, but driving on a racetrack is really hard. The only danger is they don't have the safety mechanisms in that Corvette that they do in the actual, the whether it's an Indy car or even the pace car doesn't have the same safety measures that the NASCAR does. Have you seen that before, pace car crashing? <laughs> You've seen a lot of races, David. I've been in a pace car I've, I've gone around the D uh, daytona track in the pace car generally they only let former race car drivers drive the car i thought but uh, who knew mistake mistake Whoopsies. then you yes. have to clean up the twenty three thousand dollar yeah. car Big Big oh, oh you guys wanted to race. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry he should have been made to clean up the debris thank you jared Thanks, good to Dave. see you coming up everybody the rising cost of oil how it could impact airline ticket prices american is warning about price hikes details mornings with maria